first of all, I just have to say, how awesome is this to have an all-female panel that's not on. Wait a minute. And it's not about females in business. This is just a business panel that happens to be populated by women. We've come a long way, baby. So the Hispanic Wealth Report, the Hispanic Wealth Project aimed to triple Latino household wealth in a decade. The number that they started with in 2013 was just a little north of $15,000 for household wealth. And by 2019, that had more than doubled to more than $36,000. We don't get the new numbers yet. We're waiting for the government, and if the shutdown happens, then we may be waiting a long time. But at any rate, we, we'll, we will find out whether we hit those goals in November. We do know that, for instance, home ownership has been on, a, on an upward trajectory and on track to more than hit those goals. Can you tell me a little bit, Laura, when you're looking at how much Latinos are participating in home ownership, what the last 10 years looks like and where we're going? Yeah, absolutely. So good morning, everyone. So excited to be here and talk about this great new report. So home ownership, we, all of us in this room know, it's the cornerstone, it's the gateway for our community for wealth building. And Latinos, when we think about home ownership, for us, home ownership represents stability, it represents family. And so we've long, many of us have family stories of how important home ownership is for building um, those roots, generational wealth. So Latinos have been on a long-term trajectory for improving home ownership rates. During the foreclosure crisis and the Great Recession, we sadly saw a drop in what those numbers have been. In more recent years, we've caught up to where we were and we've seen some really great growth. And so the most recent numbers from last year are that we're about 49% home ownership, which is you know, near an all-time high. There's still a really large gap with the broader um, marketplace, but a lot of opportunity for growth. And it's such an important part because we know that Latino homeowners are, have 27.4 times the wealth of Latino renters. 27.4 times, that is huge. Not percent. Not percent. Times, times what the wealth. Exactly. It's remarkable. And yet, Latino families tend to put all their eggs in one basket. If you look at overall wealth, Latino households have more than 50% of their wealth in real estate. So, Sarah, what we saw in the great financial recession was that when something goes wrong with real estate, something goes wrong with the whole financial picture, which is why entrepreneurship is the other part of this pillar of driving wealth, building businesses. And right now, Latinos are starting businesses at a rate twice that of their white, non-Hispanic counterparts. Can you talk to me, to me a little bit about what the report says about the building of business and how it gets families farther, faster? Absolutely, and um, I love seeing our, our room so full, especially because like Contessa said, this is not a woman in balance mm -hmm. kind of you know, scenario. We're talking about how to create wealth, generational wealth for the Hispanic community. And I think we have to go back to mindset, right? A lot of the times when our parents came or our grandparents is about owning nuestra casita, something that we could pass on and give as inheritance to others that came for us. And that's the best that they could do, right? They wanted to leave an inheritance. And the thing is that I think we need to start, that's important for sure, but we need to start about if we wanna create wealth that's more than just la herencia, we need to be able to talk about other assets that we're able to give to other people. And what I love about this report is that we're actually trying to find out those nuances that are particular to our community so that we can then provide education to our community to help them get to the next step. So for example, you know, there's a lot of information and a lot of stuff out there on how we need to become homeowners because that's gonna be able to uh, enhance our wealth that we're gonna be able to give an inheritance. But then there's not a lot of information, and I think that's what I love about this uh, report, on what happens with entrepreneurship. You know, Gary said it on the first date. He said Latinos were the ones that started the gig economy. 
Because inherently, in our hearts, in our stomach, we knew that we needed to do whatever it takes to take care of our family. And a lot of the times, maybe because of our educational background or what we had, we didn't have the papers where it was a college degree or something like that to be able to get some of those jobs that most people have. So then we started creating a job that fit us, our lifestyle, and our culture. This report is starting to look at the numbers of what happens for the wealth of Latinos for solopreneurs, so those that are self-employed, like a lot of us in this room are, and what they become on our wealth if we become employer firms. So let me give you some stats, because I think once we start seeing the stats on that, it's, gonna, it's going to really change our mindsets on where we need to keep going. If we look at the general population, the business equity that they have, it's about 19.5%. Whereas for Latinos, it's only 10.2%. If we look at solopreneurs, which is just, I'm my own boss and I have no employees, we see that they tend to stay very small because they, they become unsellable. They don't withstand market shifts because they don't, they're not creating infrastructure and they're not growing and they're not really able to create the wealth that we need. Once that solopreneurs hires just the one employee, we see, and we're able to show you in this report, how that magnifies and compounds the wealth that we're creating for our community. So one of the challenges to going from someone who employs yourself and no one else to employing someone else is access to capital. The other thing that we know about solopreneurs is that they need capital and they mostly get it from friends and family. So, Julia, this is perfect. Like, you work in private banking for JP Morgan Chase. Let's talk a little bit. And oh, and by the way, on CNBC, it's like been for a year. People have been bemoaning the lack of access to capital, that liquidity has frozen up. We've heard it up and down the level. But for Small business owners, it's especially important. So give me a sense of whether capital is easing up, is it going to be harder, and now that the rates are higher, how much more of a hurdle is that? Hello, everybody. I'm so excited and humbled to be here with everybody, and especially with this powerful panel. Um, when it comes to your question, I can say that banks, especially now, are very supportive of equity, racial, and helping us achieve the American dream, which is having a business, having a home. And for instance, JP Morgan Private, as you mentioned, uh, Chase, we do have a Spark, a program right now where in 2020 we launched, and it was third, a commitment of $30 billion to help close the wealth gap. And that includes education, that includes access to loans, finding people like us doing banking with us. And I think it's important for us to be able to relate to the person that's giving us advice, for us to be trusting them, for them to understand our spending habits, our cultural needs. And that is key in finding a financial person, a trusted advisor that can help you be efficient when it comes to managing your assets. Also, a big key is that Hispanics are lacking diversification of assets. We focus so much on home ownership. We focus on business, and that's kudos to us. But we also need to adapt to having non-cash investable assets, and that is stocks, bonds, commodities, all of those assets that can also help you and make a humongous impact when it comes to wealth accumulation. And when you need capital, you can actually access those, which huge, it's a huge compounding effect. And it gives you that diversification. And the meaning of, of diversification is really having different assets with a cor correlation. Not all assets move at the same time. When one goes up, the other one goes down. And being diversified can really give you that safety and risk control. In other words, if you make... <clears throat> if you make your living in real estate 
and you put your money, your investments in real estate, when real estate takes a downturn, something is wrong with your big financial picture. And yet, as the third driver of wealth, this diversification of investments and savings, the, the markers are not being met. The, in 2013, 25.1% of Latinos had retirement savings accounts, 401ks. By 2019, where we saw home ownership skyrocket, where we saw household wealth more than double, those who had retirement accounts increased by four tenths of a percent to 25.5%. So there is still a lot of opportunity for financial education and to tell our friends and families about how to access other forms of investment. I, I'm, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, to share your own experience coming late to the party with 401ks. Yeah, and I, and I want to talk about access to capital as a business myself, right? But I always tell this story. Why, you know, as the chairwoman of the Hispanic Wealth Project, when I was national president, I was obsessed with this concept of wealth because even though my parents worked incredibly hard to make sure that I was highly educated as an attorney and they were like, well, you're so smart and you're so smart. But I still, you know, I had, I, I worked for people and they were like 401k and I'm like, mm, no, I have daycare to, to pay. I have, you know, I have shoes to buy. I'm not, I'm ashamed, I have to say it. But I wanted to save my money in the bank because if I was gonna buy an asset and I was gonna become wealthy, I was gonna do it buying real estate, which is something that I could see. Mm -hmm. This whole stock thing, I'm like, mm -mm. se quieren llevar mi dinero. I, I, don't know, I don't know how that works, that's like gambling. I ha I'm ashamed to say that I thought stocks was like gambling. Like you just throw money there and just, you know, Papa Dios can take care of you. And you know, and then the, like the whole Martha Stewart thing where it's like, no, no. And then I started realizing where it was like, oh my gosh, like I've been losing money. It's not even about not making money, but I've been losing money. And I started to educate myself about the tax benefits and, and how compounding works. So I started to really, you know, become obsessed with the whole principle because this is a thing. And it never brought it home to me more than when the pandemic hit and with the PPP dollars. The people who really needed those PPP dollars, which was the small Latino bodegas, the, the you know, the El Cito de las Uñas, los beauty places, all that stuff, never went and, and put their information in there to get it. Who did it? The people who were educated, the people who knew about it. And when we were talking to the Secretary of HUD that time, I remember her saying, we have all this access to capital it's in weird places that we wouldn't think to do it, but nobody takes advantage of it because we don't know and we don't understand it. Even people who are quote unquote highly educated because a degree means nothing if you have that stereotype and that mentality of where is my money gonna come? Where is my money gonna go? I mean, I'm embarrassed to say we were talking in the back about 529 plans. I, you all know I have three kids and I say, the only reason my kids have 529 plans is because of my husband. And I kept being like, how are you gonna put that much money that we could do on something else for who knows what's Finish gonna happen? Finish the basement. To yeah, I'm like, we have a house, we'll just you know, mortgage the house when the kid goes to college. Or, the best one, one of them is bound to be smart enough to get a scholarship. <laughs> yeah. But it's about having changed, I'm just saying, it's the truth. All you'll have because it's, it's the truth. It's well, but it's it, about being vulnerable, having the mentality to say, I don't know. Like you were talking about Roth IRAs for money for your kids. I was like, oh, I pay my kids for a summer job, but I give it, it Open to rock. them. And then I see them spending it. So it's all about learning and Wait. then being able to pinpoint people. Access to capital is a lot harder, but there are still places that, are, that want to invest, like Julia said, in minority businesses. The problem is we in this room have to change the narrative. We have to go out to our communities. That's why you're here. You're trusted people in the community. We have to show people. As Hispanics, we're como Santo Tomas. We gotta touch to believe. We gotta see it. That's why stats are sexy, guys. We need to go to our communities and show them what the difference in their wealth is going to be for their family, for their legacy, if we take the next step of educating ourselves. 
if, if I could build on one of the things, you know, Sarah, that you mentioned around age, there's a really great section in the report about the power of youth. And that's what our community has. You know, the median age of Latinos is 30. That's eight years younger than the median age of the population overall. So what does that mean? It means we're, we know we're the future of the homeownership market in this community, but it also means that we have the benefit of time for compounding interest, diversifying our investments. And I think that's something really powerful that we should th recognize and leverage. And also, Sarah, you said in the report that Latinos are just now coming to an age where they can take advantage of their education and begin to take advantage of the investment opportunities available to them, as well as just career growth. That you, you make more money, the older, or at least we try to, bar, you know, fingers crossed, than we did when we were in our late teens or early 20s. One thing that's interesting is that because we've had access to loans that were at low rates for so long, this is a sea change. I mean, a lot of young people don't remember ever seeing mortgage rates where they are right now. We just hit above 7.5% for a 30-year. Why am I telling you guys this? You know this all better than I do. At any rate, I, I, I am wondering whether there's going to be this huge disruption in first-time home ownership because of the obstacle of how expensive a loan is now. What are you seeing, Lara? Yeah, no, I mean, certainly, I think thinking about that longer view, I mean, when I got my first house, you know, my rate was about 7%, and at the time, I didn't think that was crazy. So having that longer term view, but the- Well, now we know how old you are, because uh, I, I remember the rates <laughs> being that high, too. Exactly, okay, the, secret, the secret's out. But you know, one thing that I think is really, you know, powerful about our community is that we're, we're resilient. And you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And thinking about you know, what are the home ownership opportunities and thinking about you know, affordability, um, you know, it, it's, I think it's something that's really powerful and that we recognize how to make up some of those challenges. But there's no doubt that current market is tough, but you know what? It's not like it hasn't been tough before. I mean, just a few years ago when home values were lower and rates were a little bit better, you know, the early parts of the pandemic, we saw in our community that it was our community hit hardest by layoffs, by essential workers, and losing of jobs and employment. So we weren't able to take advantage of a lot of the opportunities that other communities were able to take advantage of. But yet we persevere. And so I think we have a very clear focus on wealth building, particularly, you know, I think of home ownership as that gateway for building wealth. Um, and remember, you, you date the rate, right? <laughs> I, I, I want to leave, I think uh, we're almost out of time here, but I think it would be really helpful if, given your level of experience, you leave us with, if there's one piece of advice about growing your own wealth that people can leave here with, what would be your advice? Laura, let's start with you. Yeah, I, you know, for me, I, I would start with my kids. And so, you know, we, many of us talked about that we are our parents' retirement plan. I want to be the generation that changes that. So with my kids, with their summer jobs, I opened up a Roth IRA for them. They're young, but you know what? They're eligible. Start educating them and building that wealth so they can benefit from the compound interest. I love that. To me, I'm going to give you two things. Number one, knowledge is power. This report that is going to come out is going to be the game changer for our communities and available for you to be able to go out there and talk to our communities about it. The second thing is, and Gary has always said this, entrepreneurship is the fastest way to close that wealth gap because we don't have to worry about the interest rates. We don't have to worry about that. Homeownership is a way to uh, close that wealth gap, but entrepreneurship is the best and fastest way to do it. We already have the fire. We already have the mentality. What we need to do is we need to focus on ourselves to be able to leverage and grow from solopreneurs to employer firms. So entrepreneurship. For me, it would be really start investing. Forget those fears. I know because you don't see it. If it's not tangible, if it's not at home, we're scared. But we're here, and I think we have a responsibility being the size of our community and what we're going to be in 20 years from now. If we don't make those changes, we're not going to succeed, and the economy altogether is going to suffer. So it is our responsibility to teach our kids to arm ourselves with enough knowledge in regards to state planning, in regards to being charitable, 
in, in regards to really understanding what other asset classes we can invest in and timing. The sooner you do it, the better. I heard a saying today, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So you just have to go out there and really educate yourself, surround yourself with people that are mind, like your mind and that want to succeed. And I think that's where we can make changes. Julia, Sarah, Lara, thank you so much. Great panel. And you guys are a great audience. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.